Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from TRT World Studios in Istanbul. On today's show, we're doing things by the book. We'll speak to one of the world's best-selling crime novelists about what drives him and the characters he creates. And we've got the co-founder of Istanbul's International Literature Festival in our studio to give us a heads up on what book lovers should be keeping an eye out for. But first... Celebrating the inextricable link between Brussels and the Dutch master of realism, Pieter Bruegel the Elder. And speaking of masters, we'll meet a world-renowned jewellery maker from Istanbul. Sevan Pachakçı invites Showcase into his workshop and inside his creative process. Not far away from the retail cacophony of Istanbul's Grand Bazaar sits the workshop of a man known as the Lord of the Rings. He's been making jewellery since the age of 12 that's now worn by some of the most famous people in the world, from A-list actors to rock royalty. By using precious stones as a canvas, Sevan Pachakçı has carved out a world that the entire world comes to see. And when he opened his studio to showcase, so did we. Every ring is one of a kind, so each has its very own story. Sometimes I tell a story inside a gemstone, but other times the gemstone has a story to tell me. I mean, we stay in touch and I think we get along quite well. I'm not an historian, but I'm still very lucky when it comes to connecting with my past. I was born and lived in Samatya, one of the oldest places in Istanbul, which used to be located within the ancient walls of Constantinople. I had my training in the Grand Bazaar, where I met my master at the age of 12. A couple of generations ago, the Grand Bazaar was actually a school for artisans. Later, a certain mentality has emerged, dictating that you have to produce a certain type of jewellery using only certain techniques. And it's all about cheap manufacturing and machine production now. But that's just not me. Here's the crux of the matter. A ring isn't just a geometrical shape, but rather where the craftsman finds freedom to tell his stories. There are and have been thousands of jewellery workshops all around the world throughout history. And all creators want to express themselves with a ring and to leave their unique mark. And I got lucky because an idea struck me one day. A simple idea. I just flipped a gemstone over and there was a shape of a dome and with it also the beginning of this design. This shape created an empty space for us to work on. Later we found a way to fill the space. People may think we empty out the gemstone and place a figure inside but that's not the case. We actually carve these figures into the stone upside down and later color it. This technique is called negative sculpting. And later on, we developed the technique even further and found a way to build 3D designs into the stones. I was surrounded by history. So when the time came, these stories came out naturally. This ring, for example, is very special to me. According to an old Armenian tradition, there is this ritual called blessing of the pomegranates. Every year we open our shops on the first day of the year. But before even putting our foot in the shop, we throw a pomegranate at the threshold and the fruit breaks into pieces. Its seeds scatter all over, inside, as well as outside of the shop and we believe this brings an abundance of blessing. 
Ustamın öğretisi şudur. My master used to say, we should welcome the good fortune, but also give some of it back. That's what I see when I look at this ring. Topkapı Sarayı'nda e, eski saatler. Now we're also designing watches and there's a story behind this too. Years ago I visited an old clock collection at the Topkapi Palace, featuring pieces from the Ottoman times, from the 17th century onwards. There I saw there used to be very interesting clockmaker masters who have lived in Turkey. These were Malawi dervishes, who used to produce clocks with no commercial concerns. Some have only created one or two clocks in their lifetime, but they still work to this day. And look, there was no industry back then, so we wanted to put in as much effort as they did. And these last nine years, we have done that. We will have our 80-piece watch collection very soon. But obviously no magic is involved in the creation of a piece of jewelry. It's not like the skies tear apart and there comes the inspiration. The truth of the story is this is a hard-earned vision I extracted from the history. There's also teamwork behind it all. We have a crowded team here with our creative director Emre Delava and a group that includes designers, goldsmiths, stone setters and a sculptor. Everyone is welcome to bring their own story to the table. We see ourselves not like the knights, but like the artisans of the round table. Because everyone can have a say in the creation of a piece. Arts and craft are disappearing today. The old ways can't compete against technology. But we should remember our origins and where it all began. Maybe in some part of the world someone watches this and ends up wanting to actually do something about it. If there is just one person who feels that way, well, I'd call that having left a legacy. His name sits among the most prominent masters of the Dutch Golden Age of painting. You might know Peter Brogel the Elder for his Hunters in the Snow landscape behind me, probably his most famous piece. And now, on the 450th anniversary of his death, Brussels is celebrating the Flemish painter with a glittery series of special events honouring his life and work. One of them took place at Brussels Royal Museum of Fine Arts. <laughs> In his paintings, unlike most of his peers, he focused on the working class, nature, women and, well, monsters. His art is rimmed with many symbols and details, and it's also varied in terms of subject. As well as creating hellish monsters, Renaissance painter Peter Brogel the Elder depicted elaborate landscapes too. He painted in a realistic manner, defying the time's fascination with idealistic settings and features. It's said that he painted the world as he saw it. Italians will have focused, I think, mo mostly on the ideal depiction of, of the human, which is, of course, a prime creation, maybe, of nature in contem contemporary thinking, certainly depicted uh, this way. Bruegel will focus on nature from a different angle, from the human of all kinds, also certainly the human of the lower classes, of the peasant class, of the popular life, which was not to that point uh, a topic for, um, for art and then also on nature in the sense of creative nature itself, for example, climate, weather, atmospheric conditions. His 16th century works talk about gender roles and the politics of common people through his witty and intricate characters. So it could be said that even several centuries later, Brogel's art remains very much relevant today. 
you have this personification of anger, you have uh, uh, a representation of violence, of war going on, but you have also, which is very important in this painting, but you can see it in other paintings uh, by uh, Bruegel as well, it is like um, mocking, uh, criticizing the uh, hierarchical relationships between men and women. And you have the inversions of their traditional roles in society. So now, almost half a millennia later, Royal Museum of Fine Arts in Belgium pays tribute to one of the forefathers of European painting by celebrating and sharing his works. Still to come on Showcase, in between the covers with Jean-Christophe Granger. It is a great mystery how ideas come to me. They come very quickly. Sometimes the inspiration comes to me in only a few hours. Diving into crimson rivers or flying with storks, we'll talk to the renowned author and find out how his imagination manages to turn out nail-biting thrillers. And where books come alive, the 11th Istanbul International Literature Festival is now in full swing. But before we bring you those stories, here are a few others that made it onto Showcase's radar. The Best Film Award goes to Bora Kim for The House of Hummingbird. <laughs> After 11 days of screening and tough competition, winners of the 38th Istanbul Film Festival were announced. Winner of the Golden Tulip Best International Movie went to South Korean director Bora Kim for House of Hummingbird. Set in Seoul in the 90s, it's a coming-of-age story about a young girl desperate to connect and trying to find her place in the world. This year's 2019 Pulitzer Prize winners were announced on Monday in New York City. Two of this year's winners are the jailed Reuters journalists from Myanmar, nominated for their role in uncovering the country's brutal crackdown on Rohingya Muslims. The coverage of mass shootings in the United States was also recognized three times. And the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin, became the first woman to win the Pulitzer Prize Special Citation. No comment, sir. No comment. No comment. No comment. No comment. The co-executor of Michael Jackson's estate said that he's confident the late superstar's fans will protect his legacy in the wake of an HBO documentary, Leaving Neverland. Entertainment attorney John Branker called the film a one-sided, made-for-TV movie and accused the film's subjects of being motivated by money. The controversial documentary features the disturbing stories of two men who say Jackson sexually abused them as boys. His books have been praised for being some of the best thrillers ever written. From the Crimson Rivers to the Stone Council, French author Jean-Christophe Granger has proved himself to be one of the most prominent names when it comes to writing riveting crime novels with complex characters. Showcase's Hatice Meriam Gelger had the chance to sit down with him when he was here in Istanbul to talk about his latest book and about his journey to literary fame. Jean-Christophe Granger, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. You are the author of some of the most popular thrillers ever written, both in your home country of France and so many other countries as well. How do these gripping suspense stories come to you? It is a great mystery how ideas come to me. They come very quickly. Sometimes the inspiration comes to me in only a few hours. Once I have the idea of the story, I spend an entire year writing the best possible story I have in mind. I always say that there is a spark, a little flame of inspiration, and after that I start working very hard and very patiently like a craftsman. So why do you think people love to read thrillers so much? I think what people find in thrillers is the same pleasure children find in scary tales of witches and wizards. Children like being told these kind of stories because they feel fear. But it's a false fear. They get scared, but they feel safe at the same time because they are next to you and know that they are only stories. It's a similar thing when adults read thrillers in their beds. They know that what's happening in the book isn't real. It's a little paradoxical because they read books about violence, death, torture and murder 
These are all very scary themes, but they know that it's all fiction, and it would be pretty bizarre to forget the real horrors that exist in the world. We like to read all well-written horrors and well-detailed stories, so this is what I try to do. Personally, as a reader or as a member of the audience, I love stories that scare me. And your works have been translated into more than 30 languages. You are one of the most widely read French authors in Turkey. Why do you think that is? I mean, your latest book, La Terre des Morts, The Land of the Dead, hasn't been translated into English yet, but it's already available in Turkish. Honestly, I don't have an explanation. After France, it's Turkey where my books are read the most, and they've become so successful here. My editor was surprised to find this out as well. I don't think anyone can explain why, but I'm happy that I found a connection with the readers here. The turnout was incredible in the book signings. What surprised me the most was the amount of young people that showed up. This really touched me because unfortunately in France, many young people prefer to watch things on the internet instead of reading books. My books are not children's books, but I think it's the image of a strong man, someone from the dark side that appeals to the younger readers here. And I think there is a real maturity among Turkish readers. Many of your readers found the Crimson Norris film starring Jean Reno and Vincent Cassel to be very different from the book. It's also recently been adapted into a TV series. Do you imagine how the movie will be like when you're writing the books? The number one rule when you write a novel is, you write a novel. You try to write the best novel you can possibly write. But if by chance the book gets adapted into a film, you have so many things to pray for because the medium of cinema is such a complicated environment where there are so many people who give their opinions. The idea of a good adaptation of a book to the cinema is an illusion, a utopia. I can say this because I have often been involved in the process of adaptation. I always had very good relationship with the producers though. But this doesn't mean I can control everything. There are so many things imposed on you in the field of cinema. It's the opposite of writing. When you write a book, you decide on everything and anything you want to say. If all of a sudden, you want an army of 5,000 people, it's possible because unlike cinema, there are no financial limitations or technical problems. The weather isn't an issue. You don't have to deal with the star who decides not to play at the last minute. When you see a movie on the screen, it's really the result of a big snowball. But I think I was lucky because my first film, The Crimson Rivers, is a movie that everyone loves. They still love it in France, where it's on TV. It's a great success and it's a movie that has retained an emotional link with the public. People are happy to see Jean Reno, The Mountains. I'm very happy to have started my film career with this movie. Today, TV series are more popular. I just wrote the script of a series with the same people who worked in the Crimson Rivers film and has been a great success in France so far. Maybe you'll come to Turkey too. And how about you? Who do you like to read? Who are some of your favorite authors? It's not very easy because when you spend all day writing, you can't really read late in the day. I must confess that while I criticize the fact that people prefer watching TV over reading books, I do exactly the same. In addition to that, when you're reading a book, it reminds you that the fact that you are a writer yourself and you should go back to writing your own book. But I do read a lot. When I started writing crime novels, I devoured all the great masters of the genre, like the French author Sébastien Japrisot. His writing was very strong. And in the United States, I really love James Elroy, whose books are very violent. But I must confess that most of the books that I read now are mainly informative, because when I'm writing a detective story, I have to read novels and documents to gather information on that particular subject. And lastly, is there a new novel in the works? Are you writing anything new at the moment? I am currently writing the series of four books inspired by the TV show version of The Crimson Rivers. I have already written the first one and is being published in France right now. I am now writing the second. I hope it goes well and I can complete the entire series soon. Thank you so much for joining us on Showcase. It was a great chat and a great pleasure meeting you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. They often say great minds think alike, and it's definitely true right now here in Istanbul. The city's annual International Literature Festival is underway, and it's a chance for readers, writers, and publishers to come together and compare notes. 
From conversations with authors to book swaps, participants are in for a literary blast. A festival highlight to look out for is when Turkish authors turn their talents to the DJ decks and host a party. The festival gives the opportunity to bring Turkish and international authors and publishers together to share their knowledge and industry experience. But first, to find out what this year's festival is all about, we have in the studio the festival's co-founder, Nermin Molaoğlu. Nermin, thank you so much for coming on the show today. The theme of this year's show is breakwater. Not a lot of our audience is going to know what that is. I certainly didn't before today. What is a breakwater? Well, it's, we love the theme. I mean, um, we, with my team, we came together and we were discussing what will be the next year theme. Um, and one of them uh, said that, why not breakwater? Breakwater is something you save you from the big waves, from the, you know, the oceans and the uh, seas to, to give you some space to live safely. And also there's a space that you can go to the open sea uh, and explore more, you know, the uh, more seas. It could be uh, concrete ones, um, the wooden ones, and it could be natural ones and the uh, man-hand uh, ones. So it is like literature. You know, it's, literature is our space uh, where we can live in s safe. Uh, if you want to go abroad, we can go with the different languages. So, yeah, to expand on that a little bit, how does literature act as a breakwater uh, to, to sort of, you said, to, to give us space to get away safely? Yes. Do you mean like as a sort of safe space? Well, uh, you know, in, in the world, there are a lot of big um, waves. Um, some of them are um, not very healthy, not very uh, pleasant waves. Uh, sometimes they feel the fear inside. So I think uh, it's the, it is the perfect thing to go into the literature ocean and read more books and uh, to, to understand what's happening and what will happen next and understand our feeling is um, better. So literature help us uh, to, to feel better. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about this year's festival. What can we expect? What are the big events? Well, um, we will have um, two venues, one in the um, Asian side and one in the European side. Um, and uh, we have uh, six uh, foreign writers uh, abroad, one from Hungary, uh, one from Italy and uh, England and uh, Bulgaria and Switzerland. Um, so these are the names, uh, quite well-known names in their countries and their books are perfectly fit in our uh, team. And we uh, match them Turkish uh, writers that will be together. Um, one of them is very spe a special event. Uh, uh, Peter Stam uh, published um, four books already in Turkish and his latest book called Seven Years, uh, the published last year and that translation was chosen the best translation of the year. Regai Minareci got the award for the, for the translation. And we thought that it would be perfect to put them at the stage with the translator and the writer and talk about uh, how they work together, how, you know, to create a bridge between Switzerland to Turkish readers. Um, a lot of authors struggle to get the Turkish authors struggle to get their books translated. And um, first of all, I was going to ask, why is that when Turkey is such a gigantic country? But also, do you feel like your festival is sort of helping with that? Yes, uh, quite helpful because we have the fellowship program in, um, in the festival and we invite uh, 20 foreign professionals, publishing professionals, agents, translators, um, editors, um, festival directors to come here to understand what's happening. I mean, what we can offer them, our writers, our books, our literature. So they, when they are back to their countries, they can have something in their pockets uh, to think about. Um, and uh, over these 11 years, we hosted more than 150 uh, professionals, publishing professionals at the festival, and they are quite helpful. Uh, we got uh, many books translated into different languages through this program. Yeah, I, I think it's the, the first festival I've heard of its kind that was sort of bring translators to the, to the forefront. And um, now, also, this festival is free. Is that correct? That's true. All events are free. How are you, <laughs> how are you funding that? What are you, what's the sponsorship This like? is the hard part of the work. You know, we, we love what we are doing, but it's quite hard work to, to put small amounts of the, you know, the supports uh, in the same pot. Uh, 
And uh, what we do, we go people, um, you know, ask for some help. Sometimes uh, they give their volunteer work. Uh, sometimes they give some, you know, the small amounts of money. Uh, and, um, and yes, all the events are free. So we ask people, we invite people to come and join our events uh, without paying anything, just enjoying the literature, sharing Nevin, the information. That's all we've got time for today. Thank you very much for joining us on Showcase. I'm really looking forward to the festival. Thank you. <laughs>